Well, well, we'll go to the plan and what should be done in just a moment. Just to round out one part of the discussion, uh, Ken, going back to your uh, uh, debate with Alan Greenspan, I guess you were debating him, he wasn't debating you. Uh, but generally, what, I mean, what are the, what's the lesson here? How was it that people, not people who were buying condos and things like that, but people who knew economic history and knew risk and so forth and thought about how markets could function, was it just because the Great Depression was so far away, because recessions had been these quick V-shaped? What, what, what was going on? Well, I, I think whenever you have an environment where there's a giant influx of money into your country, and here it was coming out of the emerging markets, it gives an illusion that things are better than they really are. That's what happens in emerging markets. And you lose your judgment. And emerging markets make different mistakes. And, you know, of course, the United States is not you know, going to follow in the footsteps of Argentina, I hope. Um, but it's, uh, you, know, you, make, you make mistakes. And you, th you think, uh, well, uh, our financial globalization is great. I, I heard one of the things the Fed was saying is houses are now a more liquid asset. So it's worth more because you can sell it more easily. And securitization is wonderful, and it makes it easier to borrow off of this liquid asset. So we can have higher prices. And it wasn't, it was the whole Fed. Uh, ben Bernanke gave speeches like this. And there's this, the, the, the thing that's in common is you get in this delusion of how great your country is. And there may be truth to it, but you lose perspective. And I think at the heart of what happened is we lost perspective on what was real and what was really uh, fueled by this, these low interest rates, this influx of money. And, and if I could add, you know, I mean, I think the, one of the many lessons about central bank and regulation is that, you know, the job of central bankers, as people said in the past, has been or should be the one of taking away the punch ball when the parties get going. In the case of Greenspan, that did not happen. We ended up actually to the extreme of the Greenspan put. And the job of the regulators is when there is irrational exuberance and there is a bubble to say, wait, this is going to end up as a disaster rather than saying this is the best thing and actually, you know, things like uh, uh, what happened with subprime mortgages, no down payment, no verification of income assets and jobs, interest rate only, negative amortization, teaser rates. Greenspan wrote speeches saying this was the best thing could happen to mortgages. This was wonderful. I mean, when you have regulators like this, then you end up in disaster. So it was a failure of... It's really a failure of policy of being there, central banks, a regulator, and saying enough of this. Right. And, wasn't and avoiding the, the disaster. Wasn't the political process was also reinforcing that at the same time? If I could just add something here. I, mean, I think Ken's made this point in so many words, but it wasn't for lack of regulations. It was for lack of enforcement of existing regulations. What happens in a situation like this, the herd instinct is very strong and the regulators get co-opted. They, they become part of the problem. I mean, the, the ratings agencies, there's no incentive for anybody in the ratings agencies to be whistleblower in this situation because everybody's going gangbusters. So they're part of the problem. Um, same thing for, for any number of regulators, including the Fed. I mean, I think it's just, uh, you, and, uh, but I think Greenspan in particular, not only did they keep interest rates too low for too long, but we've talked about this. Greenspan was a cheerleader for this. It was basically a cheerleader for this whole thing. And th th that's a serious right. problem. Yeah. Well, let's turn now to, to the future, where we are now in the, in the future. Uh, obviously, the newspapers, the discussion, it's, it's all filled with discussion about public investment, infrastructure, and so forth, stimulus. What do you all see, a lot of, some people here from the public sector, a lot from the private sector, mostly the energy industry, not all. What do you see across the board in terms of what the private sector is doing in terms of business investment? Well, uh, one of the things that actually concerns me the most is, of course, people worry now about the housing bust and consumption falling. But I think that the biggest story this year might be this collapse of capex spending. I mean, part is because, of course, we had a glut of capacity because of the overinvestment made by China, Asian emerging markets right now. And right now, aggregate demand is falling relative to aggregate supply. So there is overcapacity. But there is also an element that worries me that is of, uh, how to say, of a self-fulfilling kind of reinforcing thing. Because right now, you know, I see corporations that I speak to, you know, even top corporations around the world, I speak to their boards, and they say, 
we're triple A, we're double A, but we're not sure whether we're going to survive because we don't know how bad it's going to get a year or two from now. And therefore, you have to save on cash. That means slashing capex spending by 20, 30 percent, slashing production, slashing employment, slashing inventories. And what is rational at the individual level of cutting because you want to survive in equilibrium make things worse. You know, if consumers are not consumed because they're worried about the futures and if firms are not doing capex because they're worried about their own survival, then in a self-fulfilling way you get the animal spirit. A Keynesian recession is worse than otherwise. There'll be a recession anyhow, it's going to become more severe. And right now there's a global collapse of capex spending. That's why something on the fiscal side has to be done. If there is a collapse of consumption of investment and residential, there has to be some stimulus coming from the public sector to try to diminish the contraction of economic right. activity. Do, you, do both of you see that too? Well, I mean, go ahead, go ahead, Ken. I mean, well, I'll, 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 I'd actually, uh, clearly it's collapsing now, but I mean, th you asked to look to the future. Let me go five years ahead. Uh, I mean, when this will certainly be over. In fact, we may be in the next one. I don't know, but, you know, five years from now, I, w I, I, I do think emerging markets will come out of this very strongly, even with some, de I'm expecting defaults and all kinds of trauma. 2009 is going to be. You know, it's one horrible piece of news after another. But the longer story about globalization, that's not all cheerleading. I mean, there really is things going on in India. And China is going to have some political trauma, but it's still going to do well over the longer term. And emerging markets, I think, I think will do, do well generally. I, I actually think Europe will be more robust than the United States over the longer term. Why? because they've made many of the adjustments that the United States is now facing. So we've had a political shift, but I think it possibly re reflects some underlying uh, problems about you know, our environment's not sustainable, there was growing inequality of income, we hadn't taken care of our health insurance. That, that's being dealt with eventually here, but Europe's done that. And so th there are adjustments the U.S. is making that I think would slow down the economy even without a financial crisis. So I think Europe will, will adjust better. And you know, five years from now, I, th I, I, I think we'll have uh, you know, normal growth, but with the emerging markets representing an even bigger piece of it than they did prior to this. Right. Well, if I could just, okay, just quick, uh, yeah, on you know. the issue of CapEx, one thing we noticed in talking to our clients is that through about August, they're very cautious, they're being very careful, but then come September, October, November, again, they've just pulled way back, not just in CapEx, but employment, obviously. I mean, that's obvious in the, in the unemployment numbers uh, and in the payroll numbers. So big difference, almost a discontinuity between the summer and then the, the autumn. Uh, if I could, I, I, I was almost going to say I agree with everything Ken says. When you started to talk about Europe, then I sort of, you and I part ways. And, and the reason is that I, I honestly think that Europe has much more daunting problems in terms of fiscal policy. Despite what we're going to go through in terms of very large deficits, their demographic time bomb is a lot worse than ours. Their tax rate's already high. Uh, you know, their growth rate's lower than ours typically in some potential sense. Uh, so I'm much more concerned about Europe in some medium to long-term sense. And then you've got the euro, which we can sort of get into at some point. The concern that I have is the huge imbalances within Europe that are beginning to develop. In Italy, Greece on the one hand, Germany on the other. I really have to wonder what, what that's going to do to the, to the fabric of the Eurozone, maybe EU as well. So I'm, I'm a little more pessimistic than you are on that. Well